In late 16th century England, most ships were not that large, and so quite a lot of them tended to be privately owned. The average man on the street couldn't afford one, but it didn't take too much money to either buy or build at least a small vessel. A Francis Drake, on the other hand, had a little more money than most. Having already conducted a relatively successful raiding expedition against the Spanish Caribbean, in 1575 he commissioned a shipyard at Plymouth to build him a galleon. Originally, the ship was to have been named Francis, as was common for ships at the time to be named for their owners. But with the Queen being a powerful patron, her suggestion of the name Pelican, after one of her personal heraldry symbols, managed to get attached to the ship instead. At around 120 foot long from bow to stern, of which about 100 foot was usable deck space, and 20 foot in beam, she had a remarkably shallow draught of between 9 to 13 feet, depending on how much she was loaded. She was a bit larger than the average ship at the time, but not overly massive, displacing about 300 tonnes by modern standards, which equated to about 100 to 150 tonnes burthen by the standards of the day. For comparison, a later ship of Drake's, the race-built War Galleon Revenge, would be rated at 440 tonnes burthen, and some of the largest Portuguese galleons sailing the oceans were rated at comfortably over a 1,000 tonnes burthen. Or if you want another way of looking at it, the Pelican was a little bit larger than Columbus's flagship Santa Maria. Pelican was duly constructed and carried 18 guns, 12 of these being on the gun deck of varying weights, but including some long-distance culverins, and six smaller guns were positioned up in the open, although it has to be emphasised that heavy anti-personnel ordnance like large swivel guns counted towards the total ship's armament in this era. By 1577, the ship was more than ready, and Drake had received a new mission. After his previous raids, the Spanish had made some efforts to step up security in the Caribbean, but the Queen and her advisers reasoned that the South American Pacific coast would be unguarded. There was pretty good reason to believe this, as the only way to access that part of the world by ship was either to use a ship that had been built there by the Spanish, or to navigate around the southern tip of South America, a rough and dangerous passage even today, and lethal to most back in the 16th century. In keeping with many of his expeditions, Drake crowdsourced the funding for the expedition from various Elizabethan dignitaries and merchants, some of whom insisted on either coming along or sending representatives. Along with four other smaller vessels, he set sail at the end of 1577, ostensibly bound for a trading cruise to Egypt. But of course, instead, they just set out south and kept going down the Atlantic, Storms, battles, and misfortune continued to beset the small fleet, and only three ships remained by the time they actually reached the southern end of South America, and by the time the crossing was complete, courtesy of a rather large storm, Pelican was the only ship left. The Marigold had foundered with all hands, and the Elizabeth had been driven back through the Straits of Magellan and ended up back in the Atlantic. Or, to be more accurate, the Golden Hind now sat as the sole English vessel in the Pacific, since Drake had renamed her just before attempting the passage. She now carried a name that was commensurate with the animal on the crest of his primary financial backer, Christopher Hatton, Earl of Lincoln, and Lord High Admiral. Drake now set off up the Pacific coast, combining a little exploration with a lot of looting as he came across various Spanish settlements, Word of his presence spread, but most of the Spanish ships that were available in the area were either too small or just not heavily armed enough to take on the Golden Hind. For ships that were already at sea, the news took a little longer to catch up with them, and so on the 1st of March 1579, Drake overhauled the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, nicknamed Cacafuego, and with a certain element of surprise, since of course they weren't expecting to encounter an English galleon in this area, he rapidly captured her after a brief exchange of fire. The Spanish ship was just a little larger than the Golden Hind, but was loaded down with so much gold, silver, and other valuables that the Golden Hind rapidly threatened to become unstable, and the ship's ballast was thrown overboard to be replaced outright with silver bars. 
As the heavily laden vessel now proceeded north, capturing other Spanish ships and raiding coastal settlements further still, some of the silver had to be transferred to one of the captured ships, or according to some accounts, a small portion of it was buried somewhere, just to keep the golden hind in trim, as she was obviously capturing more gold and other valuable things, so even silver bars were a little bit secondary to her overall cargo. She was now essentially a large, interestingly shaped wooden chest full of all sorts of valuables with a small scattering of men, food, ammunition and guns atop it all. Leaving Spanish territory behind, Drake claimed part of Northern California for England and then, concluding that the Spanish were probably waiting for him back down south, he decided to head west across the Pacific. Reaching the other side of that ocean, Drake traded with some of the locals for a haul of spices, which were of themselves immensely valuable in that period, and then set off for home, although some of these spices and a few of the guns had to be thrown overboard when the ship ran aground. After making their way through the various islands of what is now Indonesia, Drake set a course for home across the Indian Ocean, around the tip of South Africa, and back up the Atlantic to Plymouth, stopping along the way several times to repair the ship, and arriving back home in September 1580 to find that almost everybody thought the crew was dead and the ship was lost. That all changed once the scale of the loot became apparent. It was valued at around about £600,000 back then. This equated to twice the total annual tax revenue of the entire Kingdom of England. The Queen was able to repay the entire national debt with just two-thirds of her share of the loot. The relative value of the haul to modern times depends on which metric you use, but if you compare it on the basis of annual tax revenue, a modern ship would have to be carrying a cargo worth about £1.6 trillion to be equivalent. Uh, don't try using a multiple of the UK national debt, it would make a truly stupid figure. Somewhat worn, the Golden Hind was then placed on display in Deptford, London, an early example of a museum ship. Exactly what happened to her after is a little conjectural. Some accounts claim that she remained there for the rest of her days, but there was at least one, possibly two ships named Golden Hind in the fleet that fought the Spanish Armada, and given that Drake had committed the much larger revenge to that fight, it is possible that she also saw action in that campaign, or else she just had a couple of admirers. Either way, she would go on to spend several decades on display at Deptford, until by the mid-1600s she'd rotted out so much that she was broken up, with various artefacts being made from the remaining good timber. In the modern era, a number of replicas have been made, and two of which are still around. One slightly smaller mock-up based around a steel barge is based in Brixham on the UK south coast, and an accurate one-to-one -one wooden replica which was sailed around the world in the 1970s is now a museum ship near HMS Belfast in London, sitting in a dry dock adjacent to the River Thames, and can be visited today. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.